In Jesus' name, amen. Um, good morning, right? <clears throat> good morning, church. Uh, as well as friends and family joining us today at Ecclesia. Uh, my name is Bertram, and I welcome you to our Sunday online service. Um, unless you are unable to fully appreciate what's been going on in the last three to four months, a new virus first identified in China has spread and is ravaging the world. Um, it starts small, but spreads quite rapidly where people and leaders fail to take proven steps to curb, to curb it and remove it. Bad as that has been, it's nowhere near as fatal as immorality can be to God's people. So far in the UK, over 28,000 people have sadly died from this virus since March or thereabouts, or since it's, it, it you know, hit ground here. Yet, on one day alone, not long after being saved from slavery in Egypt, 24,000 people died from a plague because of immorality. I mean, the people of God, it would seem, let their guard down. Because at that time, uh, though they knew the promise of God, the redemption that God had brought them, and the victories that God had promised and had in store and assured them of, um, they were deceived. They, were, they, were, they let their guard down when they let Moabite women into their camp and uh, to make them disobey God and lose favor with him. Yet the church and ancient Israel live in a world that determines to live in isolation from God. How can we not be affected by it? It always happens. And that's what took place in the section of scripture we're looking at today. The Corinthian church was, in that same sense, like an island um, in a sea of unbelief, in a sea of people determined to live away from God. And particularly the waves of immorality were just constantly washing back and forth on its shores. Um, and the Corinthian church got infested with immorality. And more than that, it had become tolerant of it. So just like the saying, you know, when the mice, when the cat's away, the, the mice come out to play. I mean, it wasn't mice literally, but Paul's away. Paul's been with the church, giving them a focus of Christ and him crucified, nothing else. But he's away and... They've taken their eyes off Christ. They've become proud, arrogant Christians, telling other Christians, as we've been looking in this series so far, how important their favorite teachers were. And um, not to tell them who they choose to sleep with, regardless of what the Lord thinks. So if this is your first time with us, Oh, it's been a while since joining us. We're preaching from 1 Corinthians at the moment. And Paul writes to deal with things the church has been struggling with or written to him about. And the church still faces today. I mean, in the first four chapters, he's looked at divisions. We're going into a section that looks at sexual issues or sexuality, as it's been commonly called. Um, further sections to come, we'll be looking at foods or as someone's uh, said of his seminary students, is this section on whether, whether I can drink or not. Um, chapters 11 to 14, we'll look at the gatherings of the church, 15 to 16, looking at the resurrection to come. Now, let's, let me just share some additional hooks. Although we're going to be going through the, this section in series, just some additional hooks to help us follow the arguments that Paul's making and what we're preaching. On each issue that Paul addresses, he highlights the situation, the specific situation he's writing about, and then a gospel principle 
what is there about the gospel and the work of Christ that relates to the matter that he's addressing. And then goes on to give his instruction or God's commandments about what to do to address the situation. May not necessarily be in that order, but hopefully if you lose your place in the, and I know I can be tedious, I can say a lot full of words, but if you lose your place, just to keep track, ask yourself one of these questions. Are we dealing with the situation or the gospel principle or the instruction that Paul's given? So let's read the passage together that we're looking at, if we can see if we can spot that, if we can spot any of these things. Um, we're reading today or looking today at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Pastor Ephraim suggested we turn there, and we're just going to be dealing with the first eight verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It's a very readable version, and I'm reading from that version. So, I can hardly believe the report about sexual immorality going on among you, something that even pagans don't do. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Even though I am not with you in person, I'm with you in the spirit. And as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in the spirit and so will the power of our Lord Jesus. Then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. Let's pray. As we pray, let me invite you also just to pray, prepare, ask God to prepare your mind to hear him dealing with this kind of immorality. Lord Jesus, just like we're coming through a seriously deadly pandemic and yet faced with all sorts of theories and competing voices about the way to avoid this infection. Lord, teach us here, teach us here as your body, what to do about immorality as we read with the Corinthians today. Teach us how to maintain your holiness, Lord, and celebrate our Passover, our redemption with sincerity and truth rather than with wickedness and evil in our midst this is the church gathering together lord albeit remotely um, when we gather be with us in your spirit and in your power lord we need you we need your counsel in this immoral world all this we pray lord as we gather in your name and the church say amen there are three important things i pray that we see in paul's response today one, that immor immorality is contrary to God and the church must catch it. Immorality must be suppressed using God's power to bane it from the church and to kill it in the body. Immorality has a co corrupting influence on the church and it has no place in it. So, Let's go back again over the passage and see um, what, how Paul addresses this issue and what we can learn from it. I mean, beginning in the first couple of verses, verses one and two, what's the, what can we see there? Paul is really identifying the local situation, what's actually been going on in Corinth. And he says um, to the church, I can hardly believe the report about sexual immorality. 
There is a report there. He can hardly believe it. Now, if Paul has heard this report, definitely something has been, something's been going on and there's a report about it which cannot be ignored. The church cannot ignore sexual immorality. The church cannot ignore even immorality of any kind. And Paul is perplexed that it is allowed to continue and doesn't hesitate to highlight this to the church. And even as you look at the, the verses, he says he can hardly believe the report that it is going on among them. Why is Paul writing about this, if not for the fact that the church cannot tolerate immor immorality? It's going on. It's going on. And is that, should that be the church's response? And so... No, but it can't be tolerated is what is the point Paul's emphasizing in saying it is going on and he can hardly believe it. So it's contrary to God. The church must catch it. The church must uh, cannot ignore it. The church cannot tolerate it. How can they let it continue? Um, and how they can let it continue is indeed beyond Paul. And it goes on further to say that is is something that even pagans don't do. Here's something else about not tolerating um, the, about the church catching out immorality. Here, the church is not only tolerating it, but it also seems to be advocating something. If the world is not doing this, and yet it's going on in the church, the whole world knows, the whole of Corinth knows that what's going on here is not something that is even common among the Corinthians, then the church is, by its actions, by its condoning this, even advocating that this is okay. Here's something about Corinth that uh, I found out preparing for this. Though the culture in Corinth was that sex is simply a biological need, which is, well, the same kind of view today, um, and their worship, provided temples where there were temple prostitutes who would serve the people who come to worship, serve the patrons by engaging in sexual activity. Their women were not expected to meet their sexual needs outside of their marriages. So um, it's not uncommon for the world too to have moral scruples. If the church is advocating something that the society doesn't advocate, then the church is really kind of perplexing the world in that sense. So in looking for this, I, I, I thought, hmm, I wonder if this is something that goes on today. Funny enough, I, I've, I, I, don't watch, I don't follow this soap. I haven't watched it for ages. Um, not trying to wash my hands clean here, but... I understand there's a scene in, a, in one of the soaps where fans were kind of like found some incense trust relationship a bit queasy. I mean, look, listen to this from one of the dailies. Fans were blown away by the shock romance between Lisa and Felix as they questioned whether the steamy moment was appropriate. Um, Hollyoaks fans have been through a lot over the years, but um, scenes from tonight's episode have left them feeling queasy. In a surprise romance, Lisa and Felix shared a snog, despite him being her triplet cousin's father. While not related by blood, fans aren't sure if they're comfortable with this turn of events. So the world too has moral scruples. But here is the church giving the go ahead for things which the world finds reprehensible. Something that even pagans don't do. And Paul, puts a finger on it to the, to the church in making this point that it's contrary to God and the church must deal with it. He specifically says that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother and you're so proud of yourselves. So Paul puts a finger on it. Church, this is what's going on. It's almost like, okay, everybody knows this is going on. I've spent time teaching you guys about sexual purity while I spent time with you. I mean, you would see Paul reiterating this point in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, which we'll come to soon, verse 18, talking to them about fleeing immorality. 
This is your reputation, church. I've made my decision. What's keeping you? What are you going to do about it? So we go on to, we've made the point about immorality being contrary to God and the church must catch it because Paul identifies it to them in case they were not aware, in case they hadn't seen it, do something about it. But it's your turn now, church. What are you going to do about it? Brings us to a second point. Immorality must be suppressed using God's power to bin it from the church and kill it in the body. Having pointed out the need to take action, what should the church do about immorality? Reading from the second part of verse 2, we see Paul going on to identify some things. Let's just look at a few key, key words here. You should remove this man from your fellowship, even though I'm not with you in person, I'm with you in spirit, and as though I were there, I've already passed judgment on this man in the name of the Lord Jesus. The church has Jesus' authority to act in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is the church exercising the authority of Jesus as it is given to us in Matthew 18 by the Lord himself. In Matthew 18, um, verses 15 to 19, because there Jesus gives the church instruction about exercising discipline, exercising discipline in the church. And here, this may be something that individuals struggle with if we come to the church with the wrong notion of what the church is or what the church is all about, which we'll deal with in our third point. But here, first of all, Paul is saying, do something about it. Exercise the authority Christ has given you. Because as Jesus says to the church, and this is even a further stamp of Jesus' authority in Matthew 18, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 18 and verse 18, he says, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. I know it's popularly sounded as whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. This is in relation to discipline in the church, to offense, things that foul the body. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. It's just like saying, look, best illustration I can find for this is, a, is you go outside and you go with your barbecue equipment, go to the park, set up in this day and age. And then a police officer turns up to you and challenges you. Is he challenging you because you're not inviting him to the barbecue? Or is he challenging you because the government has said people must stay at home? In whose name is he acting? Is he acting out of bad mind because you're not giving him that nice looking roast on the, on the barbie? No, he's acting in the name of the law. In the same way, the church can act in the name of Jesus Christ, doing what Jesus would do in the situation. So the church has authority and it must call a meeting of the church. Paul says, you must call a meeting of the church. Clearly, what's happened here, what's happening here has gone past the stage of approaching the brother with, the, with witnesses. Matthew 18, 17 comes into play. Let's have a look at that verse, just so I'm not speaking out of, so I don't seem to be speaking out of thin air. Matthew 18, 17. If we turn there, one moment. Okay, Matthew 18, 17. Brother's been approached by one. It's been approached by, by the same with witnesses. And the passage says, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Okay, so it comes into play because private conf confrontation hasn't worked out. If it had, end of story, because brother would have repented, end of story, and then the church helps him recover. But even with witnesses, same thing. 
if if that had worked, there wouldn't be need for this. And the church, indeed, in acting in Jesus in Jesus' name, must remove that person who is unrepentant from itself. Paul says in verse five of our text today, then you must throw this man out. It just follows it. I mean, what I've said already kind of it explains is a self-explanatory. Having failed to listen on both previous attempts, bring it to the church and they ha we have authority with not only the authority, not only what Christ says, but also Christ being present and in his power, actually putting the one who is erring out of fellowship. That tells us something about church. It's not a social club. It's not, um, you know, a clique of people who like each other. I may love you, love you to bits, make me laugh, we're friendly and all, but trust me, when it comes to doing what the Lord requires, do we have an option? Do we have a choice? If we exercise choice or option not to act, exercise or act according to the word of God, then we're doing our own thing. We're not doing church. All right. So, and here's what the hope is. Paul goes on to say, throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed. So the church is binning it now, it's binned it, and here's how it gets killed. Hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. You might wonder, mm, what does this mean? Does this mean take this guy to the witch doctor, you know, kill him or do something physical? No. Remember, it's simply putting this person out of fellowship, out of the fellowship of believers. Remember, I said church is not our thing. It's the Lord's thing. You can't be part of what the Lord's doing if you won't do what the Lord wills. So they can't, they can't attend, can't have fellowship in any way because their presence really will have a decomposing influence on the fellowship of the body. Who is it Jesus says is the prince of this world? Satan. Put the brother or the, or the erring person back in Satan's domain in the world. Notice that I said brother. The hope is that the, um, this, the, 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 as Paul says, so that his sinful nature will be destroyed, that nature is not the spiritual nature, the flesh, of course. The will that is driving every determination to live contrary to the will of God, to live not according to what God has made this one be. Let's not make one mistake here. Um, what does that mean? Kill the brother, will he die like Ananias and, and Sapphira, you know, for lying before the church? or suffer physically like Job at Satan's hands. Let's not make one mistake here. Let's not mistake Satan as God's opposite equal. No, he isn't. Not at all, not even in the least. The hope is that there will be a realization of the folly of rebelling against God when left in Satan's domain. And there's a hope of repentance in the face of a life without God. There is always opportunity to receive such one back into fellowship as we see Paul later hope in his second, in another letter that we have to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5 and verses 5, 2 Corinthians verse 5 to 11. Um, <clears throat> that brings us to um, what is the principle on which Paul has based this? Or oh, what is it about the work of Christ that makes this necessary? I said that immorality has a corrupting influence on the church and has no place in it. I'm hoping we, we come to that realization. Verses 6, the latter part of verse 6 to 8, present the work of Christ as Passover. I pray God help me to present this as clearly as he has given it. 
He asked a question, don't you realize that a, a sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? So allowing one to continue in immorality just means, gives license, gives free will to anyone looking and looking over and thinking, oh boy, so this guy can engage in this. Well, I might as well for someone who doesn't know better. But having gotten rid of that, Paul asked a question in um, verse 7. Get rid of the old yeast. I beg your pardon. Paul makes a point of getting rid of the old yeast. Now, what's the connection between all this yeast and leaven and dough to the church? The connection we understand better when we look at what um, he look at the whole statement and look at what the whole of it means with regard to the work of Christ. Verse, let me just read verse seven and eight and then I'll explain. Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you'll be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are, a fresh batch of dough. So let us celebrate the festival what festival, Paul? Not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. Now hear this. It is worth taking time to focus on this work. And it pieces the whole of this section together so beautifully. Um, cast your eyes back to Exodus in the Old Testament, where Israel, I mentioned them earlier as we started this, is... Um, is, has been in Egypt and Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt back then, is objecting to God's request to let his people leave. In chapter 12 of Exodus, God establishes a Passover for Israel. The first Passover. And that was the final act of God removing Israel out of Egypt, taking them out. Now, some of the things that happened in that, in that Passover, they put the blood of a lamb, also known as the Passover itself, um, put the blood of the lambs on doorposts, on the doorposts and the lintel. If, I mean, many who've been through Sunday school would appreciate and probably have heard of this story of God, of the children of Israel putting blood on the doors and the lintel. And then the angel of death passed by and the angel slaughtered the firstborn throughout Egypt and God made separation and Pharaoh let the people of God go. Now, that lamb sacrifice that Passover symbolized, first of all, let's not jump to Jesus yet, symbolized the separation it symbolized the separation of Israel from Egypt. All along, God had been wanting, asking, let my people go that they may come to me. Now, the sacrifice of Christ, let's come to Christ now. This is what Paul is saying here. Um, the sacrifice of Christ, Paul is saying, is the separation of the believer from the world. looking for my place here. Let's celebrate. He says, Christ, our Passover lamb, in the, in the latter part of verse 7, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. The sacrifice of Christ is what separates the believer from the world. So just as the Passover lamb, the symbol that separated, was a symbol of separation for Israel, leaving the old life in Egypt behind, the Passover night, the night in which Israel was fr freed and they left Egypt, that's the way that Christ, our Passover, died on the cross and broke our connection with the world and freed us to come to God. Paul says, get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you'll be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Let's go back to Israel again. When those Israelites were to leave Egypt, 
there was another instruction they had. Apart from sacrificing the Passover lamb, they were also to take only unleavened bread. Someone described the, the, the bread making process back in those days as one where they would knead the bread, knead the dough, and then make the bread. But in each batch of bread they make, they would take a little piece and preserve it and keep it in water. That piece would ferment and would be like the yeast for making the next batch of dough, next loaf of bread. It will be added into a new batch and it will have a fermenting effect on the new batch being made. But God instructs them, take only unleavened bread. In fact, the instruction was so strict for God of, by God, telling them to look, check through all your houses. Make sure you don't have any leavened bread lying around somewhere. Check, remove it all, get rid of it. And guess what? This was all in preparation for them to leave the land. God was going to take them out that very night. Now, not only that, look, while they did this, God, in, in doing so, didn't want anything, anything of that leaven, anything of Egypt to remain with them as they left. It even applied to the lamb as they roasted it. It even applied to the bread that they used in, in celebrating the Passover. Everything about that feast was meant to be done and dusted once they finished. No leaven left behind, no leaven on their person, nothing in preparation for God taking them out of Egypt. So that as they left, there was nothing of Egypt coming with them as they left to follow God into the promised land. Look at us now. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, so let us celebrate the festival. Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Christ has already been crucified for us to separate us from the world. Do we, and, and he's reminding them, look, just like they celebrated that feast, consumed the lamb, celebrated with unleavened bread, no leaven at all, nothing from Egypt. So likewise, as we get together as a church, imagine our fellowship. We've been redeemed. We've been saved, brought out from a world that wants to live in direct isolation from God. People don't want God. In fact, the world doesn't want to do God. But here we are, we've been saved from this world and brought back to God. Do we take anything having had the Passover sacrifice for us, having had Christ sacrifice for us along with us from the world and bring that to us as we come to God? It's total and complete separation. The leaven represents something of the old life that's not to be taken and brought into the new. So you see, a Passover lamb signals separation and the unleavened bread celebrated the separation. Christ, our Passover, signaled the separation and our lives, an unleavened church, celebrates and continues that separation. We don't want it, we don't want in it any of the old leaven from the world dragged into the church. What does this look like for us at Ecclesia? As we, as I come to, come into close. God's character is such that um, immorality is incompatible with God. First of all, what am I feeding my soul on? Is it the kind of stuff that teaches me about the gospel and what Christ has done to take me from the world? Do I get taught about God's character in the kind of stuff I feed on? Right now, even in this uh, pandemic, subscription entertainment is really killing it. I mean, it was only yesterday I found that on, a, on an Amazon Fire Stick that my, I got for a recent birthday, only I found that there are other channels that I can actually reconfigure the whole thing so that I see what I want to see on the home screen. 
not the latest version of some top world, you know, blockbuster selling movie or box set. Tell, I tell you what, all them box sets have all kinds of scenes and all kinds of ideas and worldly ideology that's pushed out. There's no funneling. It's like an open express motorway, one direction traffic, telling us the world, what the world wants us to do. There's this quote from a 17th century MP worth taking note of about what we feed our souls on. He said, I said I knew a very wise man, so much of Sir Christopher's sentiment that he believed, and here it is, if a man were permitted to make all the ballads, all the songs, if you, in other words, he need not care who should make the laws of a nation. So we can hear the church preach. We can tell you about God's law. We can tell you about, I mean, even the, even the law in itself in the world is moral. Speed limit, 30 miles an hour, so that you don't kill people. But at the same time, the world don't do nothing about who's plugging what out there on Netflix, on Amazon, on all your whatever channels. They can teach you whatever they want to teach you in all them channels and all them avenues. What am I feeding my soul on? That's one thing to look out for. Um, is God's word a staple in our spiritual diet? You know, the Bible. If I leave it at that because of time, please don't be deceived to thinking it is of least importance, judging by how little time I'm spending encouraging Bible reading. Reconfigure your set-top box. You'd be surprised how many channels you have there of good stuff. Good stuff that you can get for free to enrich your soul rather than them raunchy R-rated box sets. <laughs> I tell you, grow up on the word of God and grow strong in Christ. Sort yourself out first. Get healthy spiritually. And don't be too bothered about, you know, give any sense of arrogance you want to bring to the church to tell others how super spiritual you are. Only then can you affect and be used by God to help others. These things will equip us these days. Um, how about dealing with immorality? It's not an elder only matter. I need to say that it's not an elder only matter. What are we commanded to do? Matthew 18. We've had a few conversations about Matthew 18 recently. Go privately. We may not know. In fact, we don't know everything. We're not omniscient. We're not om omnipotent. It is a whole church. It's an all of us thing. Go privately. If you see a brother who is fallen or in sin or acting more immorally, it affects the church. It will affect you. Then... Take some witnesses with you. You have Christ's authority to do so. And then bring it to the church if they won't hear. Don't be surprised then if as part of an ongoing conversation here at Ecclesia, we can and should ask you where you've come from. Ask you about your spiritual um, relationship with God. It's not a private matter. It's something God's interested about because of his body. All of this, and get the whole point Paul is making, wants to preserve the purity of the bride of Christ. We will ask about these things, um, especially if you claim to be a Christian coming from some other church. We want to know what's happened. What's that relationship been like, you know? How about maintaining some personal boundaries? Sin against our own bodies. I mean, this is a body we're, we're commanded to use in serving God. Will we take it and make it uh, one with an idol, with a prostitute, or abuse it in many other ways? This is a body that <laughs> Christ will raise up again to immortality. Wow. Enough said about that. Um. And for us as a church, you don't want pastors who you can throw your immorality in their face and they just try and give you a shoulder to lean on or agree with you, to have a pity party with you and not tell you the truth. We will speak the truth, 
but we'll speak it in love. You may not like what we have to say. It's hard at, at, the, at, this, at the simplest of times, but we will speak the truth to you in love. Um, like it or leave it. I mean, we, we, the road is there, but we, our prayer and our hope is that, you know, you will pray for us. You will encourage us. Um, pray that we shoot from the hip, like, you know, like Clint Eastwood and take no worldly captives in the church, not keeping it in the body. Um, because then we wouldn't be faithful, but it's a whole body thing. Um, we all want the blessing of knowing God. We all want the blessing of knowing his presence and his power at work with us. But as it is, um, one thing we must do, even to preserve the purity of the church, is indeed to maintain discipline in the church. Um, at this point, uh, I'm going to just lead us in prayer and invite uh, Kian to lead us in a song as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Um, even today, as we will as a church, even celebrate the Passover of Christ, our Passover crucified for us, marking the separation and removing us from the world. Lord, we pray that we celebrate it with a heart that is um, given to you, yielded to you, submitted to you, agreeing with you in confessing and yielding um, our hearts to you completely, even according to your word and according to what Christ has done for us. Lord, help us even as we um, do this, that this word you have spoken this morning would find place in our hearts and indeed be received from hearts that are willing and wanting to walk with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.